Good morning. Good morning, uh, Rabbi. How are you? <clears throat> All right. So, a bit a bit louder. That's yeah. one. <clears throat> okay. Well, I think I would like to have a small interview with you because you have some experience in uh, a personal experience encounters uh, with uh, Bajanese in Australia. So, I'm sure that uh, the purpose of the interview to highlight the. Um, lifestyle of these uh, Aborigines and uh, your experience out of that. Okay. First Thank of all, I would like to introduce. I want you to introduce yourself. Thank you. I actually my background is uh, I'm my name is Anil Kumar Gupta. I was born in 1960 in Bangalore, India, to parents from Punjab. We are originally uh, my family moved from uh, Amritsar in Punjab to live in Bangalore after the partition. So I did my engineering uh, at BMS College of Engineering in, in, in Bangalore and graduated as an electronic engineer. Subsequently joined the family business which contains industry, trade in Bangalore and um, worked with the family for several years and um, well whatever decided to move to Australia. Uh, Ten years back we moved from uh, Bangalore to Keynes I did my master's in business management at James Cook University, Keynes. And subsequently I got an opportunity to work with the um, Lockhart River Aboriginal Shire Council up in the Cape. Now this is approximately around 900 odd kilometers north of Keynes. It's in a secluded area, a very pretty area of uh, the Cape, uh, part of Australia. And um, it's a small community of about 800 to 900 people. Approximately, this uh, community has its own shire council, and I was employed as their director of engineering to look after the entire shire infrastructure. Now, most of the employees of the council are uh, uh, Aboriginal people, and um, pre predominantly this is an Aboriginal settlement. I had almost about 50 uh, Aboriginal people reporting to me, and uh, that's how I started my first experience talking to them, meeting them, living in their community and also interacting with them. Um, you know what we read about, what we hear, so I had my own apprehensions when I moved uh, to Lockhart River and uh, but within a couple of days I was made very comfortable, I enjoyed talking to them, they enjoyed listening to my stories and my background and also of course uh, you know we are there for a job to get an outcome and they were very keen to work together to create that outcome. Predominantly the Aborigines in my opinion are they are very you know happy-go-lucky people. Predominantly fearless they have no fear of virtually anything. Few things they are scared of like simple things they are very scared of electricity. They are not scared of any any kind of neither crocodiles, there are hundreds and thousands of crocodiles in that Lockhart and the Cape region. Crocodiles don't bother them, they don't bother the crocodiles, so neither the snakes or any of the normal, uh, you know, we have the predators in the wild. And that's why very rarely you'll see an indigenous person or an aborigine uh, being an electrician. They are just, for some reason, they just scares them out. But having said that, there are always exceptions, but predominantly that's one of their main scares. Overall, working with them has been beautiful, they are lovely people, they are very uh, interested, thirsting for knowledge. They do carry a bit of a chip on their shoulder about having had uh, this uh, disadvantage in Australian society. They were not recognized in the constitution. So there's a lot of this in their minds and a lot of it also has to do, in my opinion, with the press. And, um, and very rarely people have actually engaged with them to kind of question them as well as to what their expectations are. And, uh, you know, they live in the wild very happily, very comfortably. You ask them to camp for 10, 12 days or a month or three months in the wild, virtually without nothing, it's like fish and water. They are very comfortable. They don't need anything, they work with the land, they drink the water, creek water, nothing happens to them, they eat, 
the berries and the you know the food from the from the forest they know how to you know get fish they know how to get the meat from some of the animals they know how to you know cull the cows that's it's they can survive and they can survive very well and they really like it in my opinion i think it has been for them it's like this is a new australian life they've been introduced to that you have a house you have electricity you need to have clean water you need to have toilets you need to have a deck and you go to a supermarket to buy your meat now the meat in cape could have come mostly from either victoria or somewhere else but there's meat right in their backyard so it is it is a bit i think they're quite confused as to what is you know what is the right way for them to live and that confusion then leads to a bit of at times anger because there are not too many jobs the council we had employed about i mean as i said about i had about almost 50 people or so working for me and um, from people who in the road department people in the trades maintaining the buildings um, the plumbers of course part of the building crew then we had people in the parks and gardens then i had people in the workshop so a wide spectrum of uh, people required for the council to run a council and this different people had different needs and different training different ideas and different kind of career opportunities but there are a lot of frustration because they learn a bit living in the community but there are a lot of skills required which you need from mainstream community and it's funny sometimes they get an opportunity to go out but they can't go out because of some family commitments they are a very highly family oriented people for them family does not necessarily mean the parents and their partner and their children typically it is a significant extended family uncles aunts nephews nieces cousins first cousins second cousins mean a lot to them i I've, i've seen personally in when one of the one of my boys who had uh, gone on fishing on one weekend he came back with another mate of his uh, that this guy was a person from the european background and they bought back about some eight fishes so this uh, aboriginal guy got about six of them and the other fellow took two but i asked him how they were and he said i don't know i never got to eat them because i even mean, he gave all of them to his relatives i mean most of it was cooked at home but everybody came in for a feast and everybody enjoyed the dinner and he even never even got a taste to eat it and he said i had to go to the store and get some you know dinner for myself so i found that really kind of to me when you know, our culture from india is is to great extent similar but we also always get a feed for ourselves but here i found it fantastic to hear that this guy could actually do this so it shows to me their high amount of empathy for their people for their you know their own community and um, sharing they are very sharing they have seen at times when i gone for an inspection to some of the houses there's always be three or four people living in there and you go there and there are about 10 and they had the confidence in me that i'm not going to create any problems for them so they had no issues in actually introducing me to every all of them and it seemed that all of the team were staying with them for several months and these are people who have come from other different parts of the cape who have come for a few days end up staying there they like it they get indulged by their you know relatives in terms of uncles aunts or whoever it is and they stay on for a few months enjoy their hospitality and also give back as well one guy was a bit of he was hands on he could do a bit of gardening and things like that so he actually helped spruce up the whole yard and i was quite impressed because one of the things from a council engineer perspective it's important for me to motivate people to keep their yards clean from environmental health perspective and also from safety because snakes do tend to like hiding in tall grass and bushes so it was fantastic to see that and well i did encourage that guy to even yeah. look at you know maintaining a few yards around the around the around the street so i think things like these it's quite something which we don't read in the books we don't realize what is happening but seeing it physically first hand 
did touch a lot in me that you know I need to work with them a lot more I want to help them I want to kind of see how we can make a difference to their lifestyle and also provide them with opportunity for proper training which is applied training and many times there is opportunity for them to do the training but it never happens I'll give an example like um, some of the boys had been working on these graders and rollers for the roads for several years and at several times they've had minor training on this on a small item for this this but none of them had actually overall earned a full regular qualification what is called a ticket in Australia to have like a ticket to run a dozer or a ticket to run a roller or an excavator or a grader. They had never gone to that ex extent to actually finish it. From what I could understand, the previous engineers and the council have been saying that yes, we will do it, we will do it, we will do it. It never happened. And one of the curious things which I found with these Aborigine people is that it is when you talk to them, they ask you once about, you know, can I have this ticket, I want training. And you say yes, 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 but you don't go anywhere. Rarely they come back to question you and, you know, argue with you or debate it with you as to why I'm not getting it. But some, when they do come back and you push them back again, saying yes, I'll walk it out, I'll organize it, they go back and they never really, you know, kind of insist. Whereas I've seen that in our kind of society, we, we keep going back, we keep saying, oh no, we want to, we have to, and how can we do it and what it is. These guys are very gentle. I think, I think that they call it like, you know, for them it is almost, they, they feel that it's um, uh, a lack of confidence in my opinion, in themselves, a lack of self-esteem sometimes I see with them. And it is all basically nothing to do with their ability, actual ability to perform. They're very clever people. But it's just, I think, they very easily give up. And that, to me, was quite um, a learning to see how they, they predominantly, that's how they behave. And uh, But if you kind of work with them and, you know, kind of push them a little bit, like, I was, I was fortunate enough to, you know, locate funding to make sure that, you know, these boys got their tickets. And it happened and it finally did happen in spite of all, you know, political and bureaucratic, you know, things which happen in councils. But, um, but that won me a lot of, you know, kind of um, support from the Aborigines. And they still have those tickets. And I was lucky that um, after my stint at Lockhart River, I got a, you know, work with the Queensland government to look after water and wastewater infrastructure in these indigenous communities. So I did go back to Lockhart River and several other communities to engage. So the last three years, three and a half years, I've worked in engaging with them and creating these outcomes. And I find that, again, it's like you work, walk with them to get them something and they want to walk. Of course, there are always exceptions. There's an exception to every rule, in my opinion. And there you'll find people who are a bit self-motivated. There are fewer, and you, you also have people who are not motivated at all. How much ever you work with them and do with them, they really, at the end of the day, they really, you know, they're not that interested. Do they follow rules? For example, they, do they come in time to work and or they will leave in the time? Or they, you know, what way their behavior as work practices? See, generally they don't. Generally they don't and also it is also to do with they have been let loose with this, you know, they have their own timings, they like we call them the, I mean they joke about it themselves, they call it the Murray time and um, I forget, Murray time, okay. uh, so it's, it's I think spelled Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y and uh, I was also first couple of times taken aback, I didn't know what it meant. But I clarified with them, he said Murray time means, you know, when we say 8 o'clock, it could be 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. It depends on our moods to show up at that time. But that is a perception. But if you explain to them that might you need to come, you know, I would like to see you there at this time. More often than not, they are there. 
There are times when they come earlier as well. But again, it's it's something which I think we need to kind of understand that they have a lot of, you see, uh, inbuilt volcanic feelings which they don't let out. They're uh, bursting from inside to express themselves, say that some things, but they're not able to because they don't know, they're scared to actually explain anything to them and say things to them. I mean, to others. Most so, of them are casual workers, are they? Uh, most of them are, but quite a few of them have permanent jobs as well. But at the same time, permanent jobs in a council, it's, it depends on how you look at it. But in an indigenous council, the, it, is, uh, it is easier to three strike rule, it's the same rule for all the councils, but uh, to, uh, you know, kind of ask people that they want to go, they can go. And most of the time, if they themselves are fed up, they just walk away. They're not looking too much, oh, I have to be, I'm entitled to this. I have so much of leave. They, of course, want it. They want as much money as they can get. But um, they don't argue. That's, it's fine. It's over, I'm over with it, I'm gone. Maybe six months later, they come back. Then they go, who is looking out the families? They lost income? Um, they lost income, but I think most of the time, Centrelink has a very good system for the Aboriginal people and uh, they get money from Centrelink that you lost a job and you know you you get back onto the dole and um, there's a fair bit of benefit from the Centrelink to these Aboriginal people. Like I think it's it's almost same as almost every Australian really and and their needs are not huge when you think about it they're you very rarely you see them sitting in a coffee shop having a cup of coffee spending that five dollars on, on a coffee or sitting in a restaurant and having a $50 meal. Now they're very happy going to a KFC or a McDonald's or something similar, having a meal or having cooking something themselves. And um, How much alcoholism is a problem in the community? It is, uh, a lot of the communities up in the Cape, at the, in, um, in Queensland are um, uh, dry. Some have limited carriage of alcohol, very limited. And uh, I think one or two have a small pub in these communities and there also it is limited. You get about, I think, three light beers or three mid-stand beers and things like that. And uh, you can't have more than that. There's a lot of strong regulation. But alcoholism is a problem. But at the same time, it is, it is not more than any which is there in any other community anywhere else. People like to have a drink. People, and when, you know, some people drink in excess, it's the alcohol which starts talking and then, you know, people get into, you know, arguments and fights. And, um, you know, then they hit each other at times. And, and there have been cases of, you know, when people have been seriously injured in these fights. But the ladies have a drink as well. Oh, yes. The ladies drink quite a lot as well, yes. Some of them really like to have a few drinks. And on the other hand, there are some who just like to have maybe a glass of wine or one beer uh, and, you know, they're happy with that. So, but yes, I mean, there is this incidence of, of you know, kind of um, men uh, being aggressive and after a few drinks. Is it a culture of uh, ability to drink from before the white man came? Uh, there is talking to these people, there doesn't seem to be a significant amount of evidence of them having, you know, brewed alcoholic uh, beverage. But there seems to be evidence of them, they talk about some of the elders speaking about. They, in the wild, there are a few fruits and a few leaves which have uh, intoxicating characteristics. So people were kind of uh, partaking in them for sure. And, uh, but again, I think uh, earlier times the elders in the community and people had a lot more control over their, you know, kind of their group of people. And uh, there was a little bit of, seemingly a bit of uh, fear that, you know, you don't go too much out of line and you get reprimanded. Even now, I have seen once or twice some of the elders kind of reprimanding their, the younger people. And the younger people listen to them. But that listening phase now is getting shorter and shorter. For two, three days they're okay and then it's, they slide back into their normal 
you know, get off. Uh, I mean, the kids also start to drink at very early age. Yes, because there is no restriction, really. I mean, it's it's banned, so anything illegal, if it's there and the kids get it, and, well, really, they there's nobody to watch them, really. And the parents at times are quite lax. Glue sniffing? Quite a bit of glue sniffing is there, petrol sniffing is there, and now they're doing some on some paints. They sniff some of the paints, which are supposed to have these um, fumes. But you're talking about small community, but they are, you know, they cannot organize themselves. And how do you find the future for these people? Is the life expectancy dropping a lot? Well, it, it is significantly less than the normal mainstream people, but uh, it is getting a little better. The government is spending a lot of money in trying to treat them. But treating them is one aspect and preventing, preventing. is another aspect. In my opinion, the prevention is there, but it's not, the f entire focus is not a huge amount on prevention, finally, it's more on cure. Whose responsibility preventing is the emerging leaders or the or government, or who is responsible for this? Actually, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, um, in my opinion, it should be both. It should be definitely self, there has to be something from the self to prevent. The elders and the leaders definitely need to, you know, take show leadership in that perspective, and uh, to some extent, and and we see the government has to also then back it up by saying, all right, we are here to help you and you know educate you to do the right thing and eat the right foods. There is a bit of initiative from the government as well. I mean, like encouraging people to eat more fruits, vegetables, and not just eat meat. And uh, but again, it's. You see, they know for themselves in many ways what is good for them and what is not. And it's quite interesting that some of the elders really know what, you know, which tree is gives what to them. I, I'll give an example. There's one guy in uh, Warbinda Aboriginal Shire Council, which is in central Queensland. Now this boy is probably, he's not very really old, he's probably about 30, 31. But the amount of experience he's got, he's lived in in like in the bush, what they call here, like you know, a bit more remote, and with the land quite significantly. And he was quite a wild boy when he was younger, I believe. He, that, that's what he was telling me. These are things which he's told me himself. And he showed me a few plants, which when you rub, uh, it it pr gives you a, like a soapy feeling. So it's like if your hands are dirty, all you need to do is rub your hands with these leaves and your hands are clean. You don't need soap. And he showed me another plant when we were doing one inspection, which grows a little bit away. And that plant seemed to have, again, the leaves of that and the sap coming out of that. When you rub it on your skin, it's like a moisturizer. And apart from moisturizer, it seems to, he showed me, that it's kind of like an antiseptic. Also, it seems to any, if you have a, any small minor skin kind of, you know, not an allergy, but the small skin issues, it seems to clear it. And he uses a lot of it for his, his uh, kind of kids and his, uh, you know, his family and things. Mm. So The native medicines actually, every country has its own, but how much, uh, I think, Aboriginal community have this uh, promotion or something you know, like in Sri Lanka or India, you have the Ayurvedic and you go to that, you don't go to the Western medication for small, small things and you, you know, control your diet and a few things like that, you can be done, simple things. Yes. So similarly, do they have alternative medicine there? Uh, not in the organized fashion as how we have in India and Sri Lanka and, and our subcontinent area. No, not at all. It's, a lot of it is slowly starting to disappear as the elders, you know, kind of pass away. But there is a push to kind of uh, document it and, you know, pass it on. This guy who was telling me about, the guy in Warbinda was telling me, I mean, it was interesting, I know, these are his words, and I'm not sure, I, I have not been able to verify totally, but he says we do not want to share this with, I mean, what he says, like, you know, I don't want to share it with the white people. This is quite true, you know, uh, that's what I heard as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so. But 
you know, in Australia, how many communities or different tribes are there? Oh, there are. So each of them will have some wisdom, you know, all these things are there. They don't have communication with the other races? Uh, they sort of, they do. They, they are also sort of, in some ways, uh, you know, kind of uh, related or, you know, know somebody. They seem to have been, uh, they have been quite nomadic. So people have moved from different states as well. So as I see that it is, um, uh, this guy, for example, this boy is talking about from Warbinda, he seemed to have come from somewhere in New South Wales originally. But for some reason, his mum, I think, moved up to Queensland and she f married somebody in Queensland. And that's how he continued to stay there. And But he's related and he talk, spoke about quite a few people related in New South Wales and South Australia. He didn't mention much about Northern Territory, but I believe Northern Territory and Western Australia have a lot of significant culture as well among their own people. And uh, I hear about it when you speak to them. But um, there is not any formal sharing, but it is easy for them to link up with others. There is animosity at, with some tribes, but a lot of it is like sort of also easily lit up like fire. Otherwise they work together, they live together, they eat together, that's fine. But the moment somebody starts to say something and create the divide, then yes, it, things can go a bit crazy. Now how much the modern, uh, for example, I'm talking about family lives, you know, how they get married and what kind of, we don't know how their system works. When, uh, how, you know, what age they marry and how many kids they have and how the, the, they have, a, you know, with one wife or more than one, how the system, you know, who is uh, doing what, I mean, you're not quite clear about all these things. Can you enlighten on some of these related to family? Yeah, you see, to some extent, I mean, I probably don't know a huge amount, but what I know is that earlier days, their entire family system of, you know, even arranging marriage and everything was very similar to what we have back home in, in India, Sri Lanka, subcontinent. Very similar where people from, you know, community used to arrange, like there were cross-community marriages, were quite common, but at the same time, it was sort of arranged, like, you know, hey, this one, this one here. I think over the years, it seems to have slowly started to change, where where uh, people have, uh, you know, started to become more open, easy to kind of, you know, move away as well, where uh, predominantly quite a few of the women seem to walk away from their husbands or, you know, male partners. and. Um, get away and say I've had enough of you and you're not, you're too, you know, whatever, boring or you're just, you know, you know, not doing the right thing or whatever and they walk away and they they find a new partner and uh, the men also but a lot of the men do tend to stick with their partners as well but there is a lot of, over the last maybe 15 years or 18 years or 20 years they have started to become very, very loose with relationships. Predominantly, you see quite a few of them having like um, several kids from, you know, from two, three different women. The woman also walking away. I mean, it's, 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 it seems to be a little strange, but they seem to kind of also... Is it a norm or exception? Actually, white society is an exception. Is it a norm there? It is now becoming almost a norm. You see most of them having this kind of, uh, you know, relationships. And, uh, I mean, having at least two or three you know, partners seems to be quite a norm with them. The exceptions are where people, where women have had several, you know, husbands or men have, got, have had several, you know, Vibes or something. So there's no conflict, they were fighting over the woman, that kind of issue? They do have, they do have. There's a lot of sometimes the fight is because of the woman and uh, that, you know, why this and this and this and that. But predominantly they seem to kind of manage that quite well. And somehow even the kids, even though they, you know, the mums are away or the fathers are away, you see that very strong bonding with some of them. 
uh, with their children. It's maybe grandmothers. Grandmothers, yes, but even with the mothers or the fathers, some fathers are extremely passionate about their kids. It's it's um, one of them I saw very clearly was another guy in, in Warbinda itself, a different water operator. He's got two daughters, and uh, he's uh, separated from his um, partner or wife or the mother of these two girls. He doesn't have another woman yet in his life, and but. He is so passionate about these girls. The girls live in him and not the mom. And um, I couldn't understand why. And he said, "Well, my life is my two girls." And he puts. Are all they this. studying? Both girls are yes, studying. Both are studying. He's pushing them, and I've also, when we have spoken and pushed him, I've mentored him also to kind of not let the ball down and say, "All right, this is what everybody else is not studying." So you know. And I said, you you must make an example of your girls that if they can go through finish year twelve, and then go into university or even a TAFE course, university initially sounds very daunting to them. Generally, for them to finish year twelve itself is quite quite an achievement. And I think it's good baby steps when from year twelve then you start doing some TAFE courses, and a lot of them don't know what other courses they can do. To actually get work or to have a fulfilling life. Are they happy to move out from there to, let's say, for example, you all come from Sri Lanka, you are from India, moving around from so many. Are they prepared for work reason? Are they prepared to go to Brisbane and all their places? Are they happy to go about? Uh, generally, generally yes. But I think from what I could understand is they have a bit of a fear inside them. That will they manage to live in a big city? Will they manage to live a normal? Uh, mainstream life, they have a lot of that lack of self-confidence. A lot of things they end up doing is because they don't have the confidence to move out. Mm -hmm. Some of them do. It's not that nobody does. Some of them do, but they're more like a smaller percentage, like how you said. Mm -hmm. There are more exceptions rather than the normal rule. So Can you tell me something about ceremonies they have? It normally, you know, the, the smoking ceremonies or whatever related ceremonies they have, you know, probably you may have a little bit of experience on these things. A lot of these ceremonies, they are quite what you call closed affairs. They are not very comfortable if you are there for the entire time. And uh, I am not sure why. It's, uh, it's, I think for them it's also again a lack of whether we would appreciate their ceremony or would we feel that, you know, uh, negativity coming there, and uh, they would be happy actually to engage with us at the ceremony. One of the typical ceremonies which they have quite often is at the funerals. They are very passionate about how they bury their, you know, people who have passed away. They provide a lot of uh, what do you call uh, respect to the person who's gone. Um, even digging the grave and burying the people, there seems to be a big ceremony for them to do that. And um, and also it is interesting when they drive the the coffin around the community uh, to take it to the burial grounds. There is a protocol how you stand, and if you are an indigenous Aborigine person, you behave differently. If you are a non-Aborigine, you are not you are expected to behave very differently as well. You are not supposed to actually show too much of uh, 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 like a joyful expression on your face. You are not, you are supposed to stand s solemnly and uh, it's, uh, and they don't uh, want everybody to come to the actual cemetery. It's, Who conducts the ceremony? It is their own priest. There's no... It's not a Christian, no. It is now they all become mostly converted to Christian, so most of them are still sort of Catholic or Anglo, the Anglo Church. So they have their own uh, people as a, as as a priest. the priests. Yes. Mm -hmm. So generally, their own priests who conduct it. In and what language? They are, most of it is in English. In uh, some places, I believe they do have their original mother tongue, especially up in uh, Northern Territory. I believe. English is the second language there in Northern Territory. Most of them speak their local language as their first language, like how it is prevalent in India and quite a few places as well. 
and um, they so don't do speak. they understand English or particularly in the Cape area? Do everybody understand yes. English? In, in in the Cape, almost all of them understand mm. and speak reasonably good English. Yes, predominantly, most of their ceremony up in the Cape area, the English is pretty what they speak. Uh, the older, elder people have a few uh, they, who know the lang local languages they speak, but the new generation now, virtually most of them have no idea of the older languages and their mother tongues, and they don't really know. And they have a few words which this, which like for them, uh, you know, like brother, thank you, and a few of these kind of things. Most of the even the younger people are aware of them, and they sometimes use them. But uh, most of the time, it's pretty pretty much English, and uh, as I said, some of them speak some very very good English. And um, funnily, I don't know why and how, people who write or who write reasonable, their writing of the English language is pretty good. It's very clear writing. The handwritten handwriting hand is very is clear. Very, yeah. mm -hmm. And um, but they are scared to write things. They are scared to make a report. They have no confidence in doing it, and uh, and they are even scared to speak publicly or you know even address a small group. They feel a bit uh, shy, or I think to me it's a lot of lack of self confidence. When you say and dress, they have a Western dress, or they have their own way of dressing. It's mostly Western. Not Western. Mostly Western now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all changed. Mostly Western, and um, they really don't have much of their old stuff left. Mm -hmm. Very rare. So normally what we see in this television, sometimes personal hygiene is a problem in communities there. How far, you know, is it overpopulated, there are more children, you know, how the normal average child, children in a, fa I mean, in a family, how many children each of them have and oh, I mean, they, do they have a problem with the personal hygiene? Um, you see, they, they do, I mean, they really do have extra children and, and from that perspective, if you think about it, Three, four children in a family are quite common, and uh, but having said that, it's there are some families with smaller, you know, two children and and, uh, and you know, things like that as well. They themselves are not very clean and hygienic from a perspective. But when you talk to them, they said, well, when we were living in the in the jungles or in the rainforest and those areas, they don't have to have a lot of cleanliness. So, for them, a little like a, you know, dirty place, it's it's normal for them. And, and, and they don't seem to care too much to keep things very clean. And um, it's more like a norm for them, like the kids with running noses, they don't clean them. It doesn't seem to bother them. But when you tell them or you point it out to them, then they feel a little kind of, uh, you know, shy and they feel that maybe, you know, they should. And, but but so, disease-wise and really... What is the sick, most common problem they have, common disease among them? One of them is diabetes. Well, they're definitely very diabetic. I think they don't um, handle sugar very well. And um, there are several doctors, especially endocrinologists, who work up at the Cape who are studying this particular issue and and um, they feel it's more connected to to like the diet they have, their bodies are not used to the so much of sugar which the new western society diet. So what is the normal diet they have? Morning breakfast, what do they have it? Well now it's more or less becoming more westernized where they have the cereals and... Uh, milk is available milk. in plenty? Oh yes, milk, plenty of milk available. It's highly westernized now. It's highly westernized. The lunch? Lunch also, a lot of them prefer to eat um, like a burger type of a stuff or... Heavily fat. Fatty things, but... Uh, chips, potato chips? Yes, potato chips, all all fatty things. They, f they seem to, for some reason, enjoy a lot of Coke, Coca-Cola. For some reason, they love Coca-Cola. No, a lot of sugar. <laughs> and that has got a lot of sugar and it's not good for them. But they seem to have a taste for it lot of these things. But when they start going back to their old bush tucker food, what we call their indigenous food from the from the from the forests, 
they then seem to get really good very you know it seems to help them the bodies react very well and it seems to help them a lot so there's one guy who had a, a problem with his leg he seemed to have developed a gout and he went to the medical center to get some treatment it didn't work for him and so so he knew one of his aunts uh could help him out so he went back to her and eventually she helped him out with some things from the you know trees that they went somewhere i believe a few kilometers and they found this they knew what to, what to get so she made some leaf and some something she concoction that and uh, it seemed to work for him and it he was back on feet and i know about this because he was one of my staff he was one of the roller drivers and they do have a television in every house oh yeah more or less yeah so that means they are they are you know all this you know how other people are living all the information are there they know desire for the improve their quality of living and at least the you know like for example if people think you know we are in a paradise and you have some people that we think that they are in hell do you classify them in hell if you think people are that kind of questions oh uh, definitely not they don't believe they are in hell the lot of the places they live in like for example lockhart river uh, itself that place is heaven on earth from a perspective of the natural beauty of the place the f- you know the fresh air the sea water because you consider that as heaven <laughs> heaven heaven but do they consider it heaven as well yes 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 i mean for them they that's that's one of the reasons why they feel they don't want to leave and come to a city where they call a big smoke well we 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 <laughs> we left the heaven and we are in the hell now <laughs> <laughs> all related to us anyway that's yes, fine you know yes. so but they seem to be happy that's most important yes no they are very happy where they are and lo- that's why a lot of them would not like to leave if they can bring up children etc is easy there is no it's a few minutes walk to anywhere but still people have some cars and vehicles and things like that to go around because it's everything they're quite secluded and um, they love the beach they love fishing they love getting into the ocean you see small kids i've seen them were swimming in an in in the in the ocean with their crocodiles the parents don't say anything they say oh just be careful if you watch a crocodile just watch it i mean kids kids maybe you know just fearless more fearless more. fearless absolutely fearless mm-hmm. and there times when i was walking on the beach and i was we could, the paradigm dulled into me has been that you know be careful of the crocodile the crocodiles there etc we are over protecting our children not them yes yeah. so they they know they are fearless they jumping in they pushing because that's the nature of the human i suppose yes. you learn through the experience you know experience yes yeah. the normal in average house how big the house they are well you see they who build the house first place the first place the houses are built by the government okay it's like social housing so the government owns those houses and they give it at a sort of a subsidized rent generally the rent is about a two bedder would be about 150 to 160 a week a uh, three bedder could go up to about 180 190 and they have some four bedders as well which go up to about 200 and just over 200 a week that means they must have income other of course take central link yes and so <laughs> it's funny how Yes, yeah, Central Link pays pays for it, and at their times when the government keeps moving earlier, um, the Central Link used to deduct the rent and and you know kind of pay you the balance. But then now the government has started putting the onus on the people, so the people sometimes you know take the money from Central Link and don't pay the rent. So after a while, then they kind of you know come back and pay a bit of rent and you know kind of. they are poor in managing money they are not very good accountants they don't understand the dollars quite comfortably and easily so very good ground for the people to rob their money yes and then they they very easily get robbed i mean it's not hard to rob these guys i mean in the council as well i mean as giving you an example before that I mean if you if they were supposed to get training and you know they didn't get it they just walk away they don't realize that somebody else has got training a non in this guy has taken the training dollars and got themselves trained and um thing like but I, anyway i mean they still you, you call it exploitation or what is it uh, so yeah, yeah to some extent yes exploitation because of ignorance or we will yeah, sometimes it happened way of living 
it may become a you know negative for themselves. I mean, they are you know you you know you are your own downfall. You are responsible for your own downfall. I mean, you don't knock the door all the time, you know. Yes. See, they they get easily swayed by the by the people in charge, and they themselves know very well. Yes, they so know they, that they're being. So that means they're exploiting their weakness. Yes. So oh, it happens. I mean, and 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 these guys, the Aborigines, don't know what to do and how to react. They, they don't know that the government process has to be followed from A, B, C, D, E, and they have no clue how to follow that process. And now, these uh, royalties and all sort of thing, Aborigines and kind of thing, there are other issues. You know, there are a lot of things. There are people sitting there and they are getting a lot of money from royalties. How they distribute them in the community? These are something uh, people, you know, city side. We hear about it. We don't know. Can you say something a little bit of what's going on there? See, on the royalties, uh, as you said rightly, they uh, quite a few of these corporations set up the indigenous Aboriginal corporations, land trusts, and all which have been set up, are set up to get the royalties into their, you know, bank accounts and things like that. They're also, yes, it's supposed to be a fair divide, going to all the communities on all the people and disadvantaged people. Uh, it does happen. It does go to at times to quite a few people who are needy, but predominantly, I mean. I think, let's say, it's hard to put a figure, but the bulk of it does get to, you know, if the person, chairperson of that, or the chairman of that community is from, I mean, the person is from X community, the bulk of that funding or that benefits will go to that X community. And, um, and two, three years later, when there's elections, the person from the other community gets in, he does the same thing. But quite a few times I've seen that uh, money is given, or give uh, you know some of the people who need it, like somebody has been very sick, or somebody you know has died, and um, you know they've got younger children or younger. So they don't spend on the projects. No, it's always for themselves. They don't spend for the projects. They expect the government to put that money in separately. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't put too much. They are supposed to put a bit but they don't put enough. A lot of these corporations are not auditing their accounts properly. There's a lot of misuse from that perspective. Mm -hmm. There's no proper accountability. Uh, a lot of the people employed are non-indigenous. So pretty much um, they do what they feel like doing and how they want to do, reward themselves with some good pay rises and increases. So I don't say all of them, but mm -hmm. generally that's it what happens, seems yeah. to be the norm. Mm -hmm. How is the law and order, you know, how are they maintained by the police and are they very sympathetic or sometimes they... Uh, that's a very fine uh, thing, fine line. The police are predominantly, you know, non-Aborigines in, non in, the, in the communities. They have a tough time because, you see, one is that the Aborigines believe that they have their own sort of law. And the mainstream law, which is like applicable to you and me and all of us, is shouldn't be applicable to them. Like, they travel, for example, in the community, which is about four or five kilometer radius. The cars cannot really travel more than 40 kilometers because the roads, when, by the time you start moving up the street, you have to turn left or right. And it's, um, sometimes they don't put their seatbelt, there's no car, I mean, uh, the kids are sitting in the laps, rather than in a, you know, in a child seat. And they get fined straight away for those kind of things. And so they believe that, hey, it's, we are not doing anything wrong. Our kids, you know, nothing is happening. We are looking after, it's no big deal. Okay, one little light is not working or one, this thing. We are looking after ourselves. So for these things, we shouldn't be penalized. And a lot of times they lose the license for petty offenses like these, which really, in, in their opinion, is not a huge amount of, uh, you know, uh, of negligence. So there's anger against the police. Some police people are good, they are more practical. They they're work. doing their job anyway, as far as the government yeah. concerned. Government concerned, they're doing the job, but it's, it's like these communities, it's hard, yeah. it's hard work. Hmm. But some of the police people I've seen have been a bit more lax and not lax, I would say a bit more practical. They don't, they believe that, you know, they will come and talk to you, they will even hold. Um, I think 
in Lockhart, one of the sergeants was very good. He used to hold six monthly meetings, and he used to explain at every public meeting. He used to, you know, request to the mayor for about 10, 15 minutes, where he used to tell the communities, "We would appreciate if you put the seat belts on. We would, it's for your safety," and explain to them why, which I thought was very good because I think, you know, people have to understand why there is a law rather than this is the law and you do it. Mm -hmm. So, but they're not to me like him okay. as well, mm -hmm. yes. I think uh, it's a very challenging, you know, work in an environment where, you know, you have a different uh, thinking of your lifestyle and it is amazing that how, you know, we are accept as they are, then move along, that's the best way to do. But at the same time, we have a country, we have a law, we have certain things to also, we cannot allow everybody to run their own life. No, no. Uh, I mean, it's, it's an issue here, particularly multicultural environment. You know, everybody has some issues here. But anyway, thanks for this small. Uh, you know, uh, you know, this is very important to us. You know, to you know, to know about their culture, living standard, and all the practices. Somehow, of course, it's a very big field, and you know, hopefully, another time we can find more time to explore more of that. You know, oh, surely, surely. So I'm sure who are watching this, please send your comment so that we can continue this uh, discussions another time so I think I'm sure that uh, you also can in, in input in the comment on my YouTube. Oh, thank different. you very much for your time. No, no, pleasure, pleasure Ravi. It's been wonderful and thank you for the opportunity uh, to, you know, express my, my knowledge and, uh, you know, what I believe. Uh, I find the Aborigines to be wonderful human beings and great people. I've enjoyed working with them and uh, hopefully I'll get more opportunity to continue to work with them. And uh, definitely, yeah, happy to engage more. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye.